Hi, and welcome to Barn Blog. And today we have Mac McManus. Um, um, throw out your mini CV, Matt. <laughs> sure. Um, so right now I'm a visiting assistant professor of politics at Whitman po College. Uh, before that, I was a uh, visiting assistant professor of politics and international relations at Techno Monterey. Uh, and I've written a few books like uh, What is Postmodern Conservatism? Uh, and the Rise of Postmodern Conservatism. Uh, and I co-authored a text called Myth and Mayhem, a leftist critique of Jordan Peterson, um, which is probably the book that most people would know me by. Right. And we released that uh, over at my uh, other gig, um, Zero Books. Um, Matt, I was very interested in your uh, discussions on postmodern conservatism. Thanks. Um, I don't know. I mean, I know you. we vaguely know of each other because we're sort of quasi-colleagues over at Zero. But I actually come from a right-wing background. I was a paleoconservative during the first part of the Bush administration. And I saw in your work on postmodern conservatism and also the resurgence of communitarian conservatism, particularly in response to the failures of uh, neoliberalism, um, I, I wanted to pick that apart a bit with you and then also introduce people to some basic thinkers, both on the neoliberal right and this new communitarian right, um, so that they can kind of understand mm -hmm. the battle that kind of left the void, that created the void that Trumpism sort of filled. You know, um, and, you know I also have class and materialist reasons for this, but I do think you do need to understand the ideological underpinning there. Um, you know, for example, like what's up with George Bush chastising the leader of the, uh, of the House Minority Caucus for being isolationist and him not caring anymore? <laughs> like that's new. Um, so, and I, I don't think most leftists or even most liberals really understand the distinction. And we were talking about this off the air, so I'll let you probably mm -hmm. repeat a lot of those points now. Yeah, no worries. Well, I just want to say like you, um, I actually, I was personally never a conservative. Uh, I grew up in a pretty conservative environment, though. You know, I was raised Roman Catholic, uh, and you know, um, the town I grew up in, Stittsville, um, you know, it's a pretty blue place. Um, you know, blue meaning you know CPC, Canadian uh, Conservative Party of Canada, uh, which has always prompted me uh, to take the political right seriously uh, because you know it's kind of my background, uh, and. I think one of the reasons also that I was inspired to do this was because, you know, and you and I were talking about this, a lot of leftists don't really take the intellectual political right very seriously. And, you know, there are understandable reasons for that. A lot of their exposure to so-called right-wing intellectuals are you know, Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro, people who aren't exactly the heavyweights of the world uh, when it comes to theory, economics, law, you name it. But there is actually a rich cabal uh, of right-wing intellectuals out there that have some surprisingly interesting things to say, uh, and a better, smarter left is going to have to find a way to confront them effectively. Uh, and that's kind of what I set out to do, amongst other things, uh, both in my book on postmodern conservatism, uh, the, check, the text on Jordan Peterson, uh, and a lot of the other reviews I write about people like Patrick Janine, Roger Scruton, Yoram Mazzoni, uh, and so on. So, um, so just as, as to lay out some basic terms... Um... Because uh, I sometimes am really bad about this because I tend to not care if I go over my uh, my audience's head. But when we say neoconservatism and neoliberalism, what are your operant definitions? And then we'll go at a few more before we start on the actual key figures. Sure. Well, the interesting thing is most people would regard neoconservatism and neoliberalism as emerging around the same time period, depending mm -hmm. on how you date it, the 1940s, the 1950s. Uh, interestingly enough, the neoconservatives... Um, People like Irving Kristol uh, were initially pretty left-wing, uh, even militant liberals, as it were, uh, and gradually uh, they moved towards the political right when it became obvious that progressive movements in the United States weren't going to be behind the kind of militant, universalistic, uh, virulently anti-communist uh, programs that they wanted to see. Uh, and starting in the 1990s, once the Soviet Union disappeared and you know we'd reached the end of history period. Uh, there was actually this real crisis on the part of many neoconservatives who kind of started asking themselves, well, now what is our existential mission going to be? You know, the evil empire is done. Uh, it seems like liberal democracy is going to spread across the globe. What's the kind of mission we can set for ourselves? And, you know, we all know how that ended up. Uh, it didn't end up very well, right? Mm -hmm. 
And you, know, you can see people. Yeah, war and terror basically is the is the like stand in they try for it. Although I mean, it is interesting. Like you have figures who deviated from that, like Francis Fukuyama, who oh yeah, does move back left ish over time in response to that. So in his book Dignity, he said it's time to give socialist ideas another try. So yeah, you know, if you're listening, Francis, you know, <laughs> welcome to the team. You know, we appreciate you coming here. It took a while, but you know, better late than never. Right. So so you you would assume. But it's interesting because I think I think in a lot of vulgar leftist courses, those words are thrown around as if they're the same thing. But neoconservatism is almost it's a political and foreign policy orientation, whereas neoliberalism, while it is a political project with foreign policy implications, is an economic orientation with with a political project attached to it. So like those are and they and there are plenty of non neoconservative neoliberals. Oh, absolutely. Are there a lot of neo? Uh, are there are are there a lot of non neoliberal neoconservatives though? I I wouldn't say so. I mean, most of the neoconservatives, broadly speaking, uh, tend to endorse some iteration uh, of market economics. Uh, and in mm -hmm. fact, the reason why they were neoconservatives in part because they felt that while liberal democracy might be spreading across the globe starting in the 1990s, uh, it wasn't clear that the market was going to follow uh, as effectively, particularly places like the Middle East, China, uh, and so you know. They need to do what they could in order to get the gears rolling on that. Uh, but I think it's important to note that for many of the neoconservatives, this was more than just a foreign policy project. It's sometimes reduced to just this. Uh, and there's good reasons for that since the neocons were really fixated on foreign policy uh, above all other kind of issues. But they also saw it in kind of an existential sense as well. Uh, and you can see this in things like the Project for the New American Century, uh, which is spearheaded by Bill Kristol, mm -hmm. where he talks about how with the end of the Soviet Union, uh, there's this th real threat that what's going to set in is decadence, decline, uh, Americans just becoming focused on things like buying the next refrigerator that happens to be released, uh, you know, paying attention to social trends and fashion and music, keeping up with the Joneses. Uh, and he saw that as the death knell uh, for American civilization, because unless it has some kind of mission uh, that it sets itself towards, uh, it, the empire is not going to last forever, needless to say. Uh, right. So one of the reasons why he saw it as important for Americans to engage in these really ambitious attempts uh, at world policing and later nation state building construction uh, was precisely provide this kind of existential mission, uh, which would stave off decline for at least a little while. Right. Uh, yeah. And it's also worth noting that this was well funded in part by uh, many people in the uh, military industry who, for obvious reasons, had deep concerns about the end of the Cold War uh, and the possibility that the U.S. government might decide to slash military spending very substantially, which would obviously be the death knell for many people in the industry. Right. Right. So let's introduce a few more terms um, so that people understand some of the other distinctions that come up to a head. Paleoconservative and libertarian. Like, let's talk about those because those get <laughs> those people. I think actually because of Lou Rockwell in the in the late nineties, early aughts, those get linked together. But they're traditionally actually opposed to each other and to neoconservatism. Um, so, how would you define those terms? Okay. Well, neoliberalism in its classical orientation uh, is very, very hotly contested. Um, mm. Typically speaking. Um, People admit that somebody that people like, like figures like uh, Milton Friedman coined the term neoliberalism. Uh, for instance, in the 1950s, Milton Friedman uh, had a paper that he released called "Neoliberalism and What Are Its Prospects." Uh, mm. I don't think that's the exact title, but it was something to that gist, right? Uh, and he kind of lays out the guidelines of what he sees the neoliberal position to be. But after the 1950s, people uh, on the political right uh, that the left associated with neoliberalism were very hesitant uh, to embrace it, right? Uh, F. A. Hayek, you know, famously said. I am not a conservative, and he also said I'm not a libertarian or a neoliberal. Uh, I'm kind of a classical liberal, or mm. you know, if you want to use the more technical term, a Kantian consequentialist, right? Right. Uh, you know, that's the kind of yeah, that's the kind of fancy term that he came up with. Uh, Murray Rothbard, uh, who you pointed out, uh, mm. famously, you know, kind of shifted from being a libertarian to an anarcho-libertarian to a paleoconservative of sorts. Um, Milton Friedman always just defined himself later on, not as a neoliberal, but as a kind of classical liberal in the vein of somebody like J.S. Mills. Uh, and the big reason for this is because they understood that neoliberalism had become essentially a pejorative term uh, that people on the left like to stick onto them. 
Uh, and mm. so, of course, their number one visceral reaction was to just reject being associated with it. But generally speaking, the way that political, that leftists understand neoliberalism uh, is as an attempt to encase the market from democratic pressures. Uh, and what's interesting about this is despite the fact that neoliberalism is often associated with a kind of anti-statism, the neoliberals were very cognizant of the fact that the way to encase the market from democracy would be through the state. Uh, and in fact, what's really interesting and recent work on this uh, has really exposed it really well. People like Quinn Slobodian uh, and Jessica White, uh, they didn't even trust the state to be sufficient to encase the market from democracy uh, because they had seen through the 1940s and 50s how the state could still be co-opted by really concerted leftist pressure, uh, which is why the neoliberals were convinced that you also need an international legal order um, embodied in institutions like the World Bank, the IMF, the WTO, in order to preserve uh, capital from democratic pressures at the state level. Uh, so if your state happens to get captured by you know, a radical democratic party that actually wants to institute market changes in market relations, doesn't matter, the international legal regime will step in and prevent that from happening. Yeah, I, I pull a lot from the work of Philip Moransky on this on this uh, area, um, and I also am fascinated how neoliberals not just wanted to protect the market; they actually wanted to create markets and then isolate them for democratic pressures, while yeah. also making them dependent on different kinds of legal regimes that, in some ways, even compel participation in them. It was, and I found it interesting. And this is a division on the old libertarian right that people mm -hmm. don't understand but like when Lud uh, when Ludric Mises was sitting with the Montpelerin society he actually like calls them all socialists and leaves because he's you know mm -hmm. he he's just like no there's no state intervention you know no state intervention we have true laissez-faire 19th century capital we're, the state you know no one's going to protect us we don't need to worry about it go and the interventions that that um ironically these people were doing to protect the market from democratic pressures from the from, from the pressures that the Austrian economist, you know, Schupender had actually kind of laid out for them. Um, they, uh, <laughs> you know, it leads to this weird divide amongst libertarians. Um, and you, you, Rothbard is an interesting case point example where oh, yeah. he, 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 he's uh, in the von Mises ring of things. He kind of takes over von Mises' legacy. Um during the 60s and 70s, he was talking about using Maoist coalitions with, <laughs> with, with libertarians to fight, to fight, you know, the Fordist policy. Make like he was just like, we can use these Maoists, and I was like, and it's I found it hilarious because when I went back and read uh, the von Mises Institute's version of these essays, now they cut those parts out. Um, <laughs> They're also rather <laughs> uncomfortable with his comment uh, in the book Liberalism, that where he says. There's no doubt that the fascists have at least temporarily saved European civilization. Right? Yeah, uh, it's not <laughs> something you usually see. Uh, typically foregrounded uh, by the Mises Foundation and stuff. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, so yeah, so we have that distinction, um, and that's good. And that's good to understand. But what defines paleoconservatism? Because I think that's the category mm -hmm. that. I kind of think is is related to the two the couple trends we're going to talk about contemporaneously, but it's been simmering in the background irrelevantly for like thirty years. So, what's going on there? Well, paleoconservatism is even more vague in some respects uh, than neoliberalism uh, or neoconservatism, uh, in part because it's comparatively new, which is odd mm -hmm. if you think about you know the kind of paleo label. Uh, neoliberalism and neoconservatism, like I mentioned, have been around at least in gestational form. Uh, since the 1940s and 1950s. So we have had a good long time to theorize about them, say what they are. Uh, Paleoconservatism, uh, many of them were effectively liberals, or sorry, uh, neoliberals, um, who became concerned that the kind of liberal methodology and outlook uh, that underpinned a lot of neoliberal uh, theory uh, wasn't sufficient uh, to actually get them the kind of society they wanted. Uh, and there are a lot of different reasons for this, but the big one is that they started to appreciate that the kind of market society that they had advocated for was ultimately not very stable. It was defined, as you put it, uh, via Schupenter, by creative destruction, the corrosion of traditional values, uh, by demands for inclusion uh, on the part of minorities. Um, and all of this was actually backed up by neoliberal rationality, since, of course, uh, if you want to have a free market in labor, that's going to entail very high levels uh, of immigration and consequently a very pluralistic society. 
right? Uh, and so the paleo conservatives reacted against this by saying that we need a thicker glue uh, in order to bind our society together, typically one that's going to be predicated on ethno-religious principles. Uh, and as you mentioned, this is going to be very influential for many of the kind of post-liberal figures uh, that we're going to emerge later on. Uh, although, you know, what exactly this glue was going to be uh, was never really a, a matter of consensus uh, amongst the paleoconservative movement, uh, in no small part because of many paleoconservatives like Rothbard uh, ended up endorsing, frankly, racism, uh, which, of course, led to them becoming unpopular, uh, which in turn led other paleoconservatives to start to distance themselves uh, from some of those more extreme views. Yeah, I think about the history of uh, the American Conservative magazine, where you have Taki and and, <laughs> and and Pat Buchanan in the beginning, and they're even doing this whole reach out into liberalism on the anti-war stuff. Like they were publishing all kinds of anti-war articles, but you know, I, I like to refer to it as the Richard Spencer problem. And a lot of people don't know this, except when I bring it up. Richard Spencer was an associate editor for Arts at American at Amcom. Um, he does get the boot for being for his relationship to uh, the National Policy Institute, which sounds pretty innocuous, innocuous but it's, uh, you know, a long existing racist think tank out of Augusta, Georgia. Have you ever seen Taki's magazine? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's really I funny. Like, I looked at it once and I was just like, oh, so there's a cute girl who's like in pink and all that stuff. And then I went and clicked on one of the articles. I'm like, oh, so you guys are just, you know, kind of proto-Nazis or proto-fascists. This is kind of an unusual branding effort, right? Um, yeah. Actually, when I was moving left and and uh, I was I did um, a project with Doug Lang, and actually probably shouldn't mention this too much, but the first pop the left, we have a co-host who who cut out and uh, went right. And you know where he went first? Really? Was, yeah, um, Nicholas Pell. You know where he went first? Talkie Mag. Uh, yeah, and yeah, that not. was like that was like the sign, and that was like the hard break. You know, once you've done that, that's even bigger than going to Car Tucker Carlson or whatever. There's no coming back. So, so uh, yeah, and um, it's unfortunate, but it, it's also something I've seen. But yes, yeah, so I've seen Talkie Mag, and it, and then you had um, on the sound spectrum of that when the alt right started coming out, it came out of this milieu too, but even. Even people who were who had inspired it, like like Paul Gottfried, mm -hmm. um, immediately pull back from it, like like way earlier than before it was known, because I think they saw where the, the problems that was going to come out of it. Um, they said the quiet parts too loud, and so <laughs> yeah. it's and, surprising how often that happens, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um, so you know I, what I find interesting is you're right. Uh, Paleo conservatism is new. It really comes out of the late '80s. Um, with Pat Buchanan and Joe Sobrin and a lot of these kind of nationalist Catholics who reject the kind of international mission and start, I think, positing either a racial or a spiritual or both <laughs> mission for the cohesion of the nation. Um, well, I just wanted to kind of intervene there. Uh, and this is actually an argument I'm making in uh, my recent book, The Emergence okay. of Postmodern Conservatism, where I say that paleoconservatism uh, is in some sense the mirror image of neoconservatism, since they're both fixated on this idea that now that the Cold War is over and we've won the economic argument, we have to start being skeptical uh, about mm. market society and the liberal principles that underpin it, at least in the United States. And it's different elsewhere. Uh, and we should be clear on that, right? Uh, but the neoconservatives, as I mentioned, their idea was in part, well, we can still have a market society, but we need more. We need a glue. And that glue can be provided by foreign policy adventurism. Mm -hmm. you know, we'll form an American empire light, uh, as Michael Lee would call it. Uh, we'll govern that empire like the Romans of old. Uh, and that will provide us with a kind of world historical mission. Um, and, you know, this has led to all kinds of surreal things later on with the Bush administration that we can talk about. You know, mm -hmm. we're never going to forget, you know, that infamous comment, you know, we're an empire. We create our own uh, reality now you know, coming out <laughs> yeah. of the administration. Right. Uh, but the paleo conservatives took a different approach, which actually anticipated Trumpism quite a bit more. Right. Uh, once neoconservatism was discredited because of the catastrophic uh, war on terror, right? Uh, where they carry neoconservatives, sometimes were foreign policy adventurous, but typically would say things like, no, you know, the glue needs to come from within. Uh, it needs to be a religious glue. It needs to be an ethnic glue. Might even need to be a racial glue, right? Which, as mm -hmm. you pointed out, was the quiet part that they sometimes were prone to saying loud, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Or all of the above, right? Uh, and if we don't have that kind of glue and we just let market society run its course, what we're going to get is increasing levels of pluralism, high levels of creative destruction, uh, and eventually the corrosion of the kind of social attachments that 
once made America great uh, and are now responsible, or, or sorry, are now disappearing, which is why we're starting to fall, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but with both of these movements, you see this real paranoia uh, underpinning uh, their outlooks, uh, this kind of theorem of decline and fall, uh, where they differ fundamentally is the solution to that. Yeah, so so now we can get to some of these key figures just so we have terms. Of course, I, I'm avoiding getting into the great debates over what is and is not fascist and what, you know, and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I would also say... Uh, maybe that's always a fun conversation. Yeah, <laughs> what <is> fascism. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll be here till fucking midnight. You know? You're right. Gra exactly. Grab a warm chair and uh, a big pot of coffee with some whiskey. Yeah, I, um, I, I have done uh, discussions with uh, the Regrettable Century podcasters on on that, and we like even amongst ourselves, and we've studied it for a long time. We're just like, well, we got another fifty hours to discuss this. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's. It's uh, what I will say though about about paleoconservatism is it did seem more willing to embrace and soften things would it be, ha, would have been con traditionally considered too close to the far right. Um, mm -hmm. And by, by the far right, the one thing I'll also say is from from the grand historical tradition, all of these groups, with the exception of part of the paleoconservatives, consider mm -hmm. themselves to be out of the liberal tradition. So that's yeah. what separates them from like domestic reactionaries, right? Are like European blood and soil people, you know, who do not see themselves as part of a liberal tradition. Well, you can see um, that very fundamentally with somebody like Bill Crystal or who we were talking about earlier on David Frum, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, you know, Crystal and Frum were probably the most militant, and I mean fucking militant, anti-Trumpist, uh, mm -hmm. never Trumpers you'll find, right? Um, and it's because both of them saw themselves as fundamentally liberal individuals. Uh, committed to a kind of representative democracy, the protection of liberal rights, uh, and they saw Trumpism as an existential threat to that from within. Uh, mm -hmm. So they refocused their energies from uh, the not quite existential but still serious threats that they perceived from without uh, to this new kind of boogeyman that was emerging in their own movement, right? Mm -hmm. So what, now let's talk about, like, maybe maybe let's start with the older figure first and we'll talk about the more contemporary ones. Mm -hmm. um, uh, who do you think is key as thinkers? If you would tell people, I, you know, don't waste your time listening to Ben Shapiro. Don't waste your time listening to PragerU. Maybe waste your time reading the conservative columnists in, in the New York Times. But even even know that that's the low rent version. Um, who would you tell people to go to to start understanding the different frameworks for these movements? Well, I should say, I, I'd never tell people don't bother with Ben Shapiro because I right. wasted my time reviewing a lot of his <laughs> books. Uh, so if you want to laugh uh, and you have a sick sense of humor like <laughs> I do, it, it, it's fun. You know what I mean? He has a new book coming out during the summer. I'm going to review it for somewhere. I don't know what it says right now because I haven't read it, but I have a pretty good guess having read two of his books before. So, you know, look forward to that. Uh, but when it comes yeah, to more serious conservative thinkers, uh, I think that if you're looking at a lot of the figures that anticipated somebody like Donald Trump, because uh, here we have to be careful, right, that there are different movements within the political right, uh, very mm. complicated movements, and so there are different genealogies we need to draw, right? Just like there are different people in the Marxist tradition, from the feminist tradition, uh, so too is that true of the conservative broadly movement, right? Uh, so in terms of Trump, uh, the people that I talk about in my book, The Rise of Postmodern Conservatism, uh, as being the most important intellectual antecedents to something like Trumpism, uh, are Edmund Burke, Joseph Demestra, who you already mentioned, uh, Michael Oakeshott, uh, who's mm -hmm. less well known in the United States, but it seems to be gaining a bit of a reputation, um, Lord Patrick Devlin, uh, who is an English judge, uh, and then Robert Bork, uh, who some of your missiles might be familiar with uh, because he was a Reagan a point, not a point, a Reagan nominee. Uh, for yeah, he got Bork. Bork. He got rejected. He got Borked, exactly. <laughs> yeah, which is where that phrase comes from. Uh, initially enough, uh, the term postmodern conservatism, as far as I know, was first applied to Robert Bork mm -hmm. uh, in, uh, I think it was, I think it was Harvard Law Review. Yeah, it was Harvard Law Review article uh, about Borkism uh, as a constitutional theory, uh, where somebody labeled him a postmodern conservative. So those are the thinkers I usually talk about as a genealogy uh, for Trumpism. Uh, and the reason why I talk about them specifically is they all are critics uh, to a certain extent of what we might call broadly enlightenment rationalism, mm -hmm. right? They believe that reason, uh, 
conceived of along Lightman terms, is fundamentally limited in its capacity to understand the world. Uh, and the problem with people who put too much stock in reason uh, is they start getting big ideas in their head about how it is that they can remake society, how they can challenge tradition, uh, and how they can challenge the hierarchies uh, that are associated with tradition, right? Uh, and so all of them you know, argue from very different standpoints. Uh, you know, Oakshot is a kind of Hegelian of a, in a weird sort. Uh, Berg is a Burkean, you know, mm -hmm. to put it bluntly. Uh, Joseph Demaestra, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Joseph Demaestra uh, is a kind of Roman Catholic, but an, a strange one, and we can talk about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they share this kind of conviction, and their argument is all: look, uh, what we need is a kind of irrational or pre-rational, depending on you want to turn it, uh, respect for the established order. Because uh, if you don't have that, then what you're going to have is too much corrosive rationalistic questioning which is gonna to lead to a destabilized sense of identity uh, and even a kind of sense of cosmic disorder, uh, which is only gonna end in violence and destruction uh, and the elevation of the unworthy to a position uh, that they're not entitled to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, now this isn't uh, entirely true uh, of someone like Oakshot, who was a bit of a liberal, um, but you know, most of them make arguments to this uh, in this respect. Uh, and they also all foreground identity uh, as a kind of pre-rational category that's extremely important uh, since, of course, you gain your sense of identity through being a member of a social hierarchy that's embedded within a broader tradition. Uh, and one of the reasons all these figures are concerned about the spread of Enlightenment rationalism and progressivism later on uh, is they see these forces as fundamentally corroding uh, the sources of identity that provide us with a sense of who we are and, you know, let's be honest, what we should be doing uh, and what our place is. Uh, and I mean what our place is in the full derogatory sense, right? You know, you're supposed to be at that rank of society uh, and you shouldn't be questioning that all that much. Yeah, so um, I am, uh, I, I, think that's, I think that's interesting. And it also is an interesting combination there and some subtle differences because <laughs> Let's take Demestra, because Demestra was critiquing the Anshan regime, and basically he is the theorist of reaction, because for him, oh, yeah. conservatism, or even Anshan regimeness, is to defend something that should be a natural traditional order. By the time you stake it as a tradition, it is already dying. So, you know, reaction has to be more vitalistic, you know, more based on... Um, a lot of different criteria. But what I also find about him that's interesting is, is Catholic, conservative Catholic thought prior to the French Revolution was not particularist. No, um, not at all. After Demestra, there's a strain of it, which is never popular in the church, but is popular outside of it or adjacent to it, that is particularist. Like, because Demestra talks about like, I've never met a universal human being. I've met a Scott, a Pole, mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever. But I've never met, you know, mankind and 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 stuff like that in his rhetoric, right? Like, so that's interesting compared to him. And and in that sense, like Burke in some way comes to similar conclusions about rationality. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But from a liberal perspective, actually, is from mm -hmm. the standpoint of, of English politics prior to the French Revolution, and would have probably been horrified by a lot of Demestra's conclusions, but the fundamental core of rationalism is going to break down the social order. These enlightened philosophers have gone too far. Um, the rhetoric well, I, doesn't change that much, guys. <laughs> like, <laughs> absolutely. And I, I mean, I try to make this clear in my book that I think Joseph de Maistre, uh, frankly, is a monster when he calls for the death of 4 million Frenchmen uh, to pay for one king that they happen to right. execute. There's no way to describe that except genocidal, right? Uh, Burke actually endorsed a lot of policies that I happen to agree with. Right. Uh, you know, he wanted more home room for Ireland. Uh, he was opposed to Indian colonialism. Uh, he supported the American Revolution. Uh, he actually was mildly enthusiastic about the earlier stages of the French Revolution. It's only when it went uh, in his mind too far that it became more critical. So I'm not saying that we should paint these people all with the same moral brush. There's extremely important distinctions between them uh, that I tried to foreground in my writing. Um, but I think what you said about De Maestra, uh, is really important uh, because he's the one that I focus on probably more than anyone else, uh, both in the book and elsewhere, uh, precisely because he displays the kind of visceral reactionary attitude at its purest uh, and an, at an originary moment. Uh, because you can tell that De Maestra is unsure in some respects about how to go about arguing for his positions. The reason being that a lot of the traditional arguments that one would rely upon in order to 
vindicate uh, kind of right-wing Christianity, uh, you know, scholastic arguments in particular, just weren't cutting it anymore. Uh, I mean, you read somebody like Thomas Hobbes in Leviathan, uh, he mocks Aristotle and he says, there's nothing more offensive to reason uh, than Aristotle's ethics, nothing more foolish than his metaphysics, and just lampoons the guy. Um, and when you recognize you know, how important Aristotle was to Christian metaphysics, uh, particularly scholastic Christian metaphysics, that's really quite damaging, right? The fact that people just aren't even taking them seriously anymore. So he needs to find a new way uh, to kind of vindicate these old ideas. Uh, the problem being that, of course, since they are traditional ideas that have been around for a long time uh, and they're supposed to be obeyed uh, rather than questioned, uh, there's something that's inherently paradoxical about even trying to provide a justification for them. Because the minute you provide a justification for them, you say that they need a justification or you're implying that they need a justification. You know, I need to justify myself to you. Right. Uh, and so a lot of his tone, I think, flows from this indignation that he even has to be engaging in an exercise like this. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the virulence and anger uh, that comes stems from this kind of conceit. Right. That these arrogant philosophers have dared to question received wisdom that should be treated like dogma. Uh, they have no idea what it is that they're actually doing and the kind of damage that they're going to causing. Uh, and so I'm going to deign uh, to respond to them. Uh, but really the best way to deal with them, as he frequently puts it, is through the hangman. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. The hangman is the real foundation of civil society. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I always think about what is it? Um, there's a movie... I, this movie title has lost my has uh, completely gone out of my head. Um, the 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 dim bone song where you have the Jesus figure, the 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 crazy hippie Jesus figure, go full Demester and was like, you know, he says exactly that. The hangman is the is the basis of all society. Um, yeah, and, and the thing that's the reason I characterize him as an important predecessor to postmodern conservatism in particular mm -hmm. uh, isn't because Nietzsche, uh, Marx de Maestro was a proto postmodernist. He's not, uh, but it's because he associates this kind of aristocratic disdain uh, for explaining himself uh, with a critique of reason. Because uh, he mm -hmm. says reason uh, is fundamentally a destructive force. Philosophy, as it calls it, is fundamentally a destructive force. It constantly questions, it's constantly bothersome, uh, it always asks you to explain yourself and to justify yourself. And power doesn't need to justify itself. Uh, power should be self-justifying and treated, as he puts it, uh, like a dogma. You know, uh, so the problem uh, with modernity to someone like Demestra is precisely the fact that this hyper-rational, constantly questioning, even Socratic attitude is becoming ubiquitous. Uh, and now everybody thinks that they can question authority. Right. Uh, and what he's really anxious about is, of course, if everyone thinks that they can question authority, where is authority going to come from any longer? Right. Yeah. They're, they're listing these figures as as like the, you know, the kind of great granddad figures of, of Trumpism is very interesting to me in a way, because in some reason, in some ways, it, it and maybe we'll get to, to Okashad in a minute because he's the one that I know, but most mm -hmm. people don't. Like when I throw that name out, mm -hmm. most people have no idea who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But um, they're more likely to know someone, you know, who, in the grand scheme of things, is actually far more obscure, um, mm -hmm. like like Rene Grenon or, like I said, Julius Evola or somebody like that. Then uh, Evola's okay, fun to read, uh, though. I mean, he's so fucking racist and so <laughs> fucked up. You know, it's just it's bizarre. Anyway, yeah, Evola's fun in the sense that like he's racist, and then he gets mad at Nazis for being racist because they're not racist for yeah. the right reasons. They're biologically racist, not spiritually racist. Yeah. I, I, should <laughs> say, I, I say I say fun glibly, right? These fascists are always so fucking weird and all over the place, and they have no ability to like systematize or provide any kind of firm logic to their system. And it, yeah, no, I completely agree. So, and so I always find that interesting that we focus on them and not people like Oakenshot, who mm -hmm. do have fairly systemic critiques that are not um, completely off base. And what, but my other, my other thing is that I said before Trump, I was like, Trump reminds me that like American conservatism is finally Europeanizing. And mm -hmm. people were like, what do you mean by that? I'm like, oh, yeah. It sounds a lot more like European conservatism than anything in the 20th century does. Um, and, you know, it, I mean, yeah, it rhymes with people like Bolasconi, but like, and I think that the Demestra plus, plus Burke is like how you can pin those together um, in a way that makes sense to 
to to generalize in a way that's not responsible an American mind as opposed to um, blood and soil, king and crown nationalism, which would be far into a settled colonial liberal society. Like, it's just, we can't justify that. Um, Absolutely. And th this is one of the things that I, I point out um, in some of the recent work that I'm doing. Uh, Americans tend to see themselves as being at the center of the universe. And yeah, there's good mm -hmm. reasons for that. The Romans felt the same way, you know, the Chinese felt the same way and during the Han Dynasty, you know, but there is this tendency on the part of American conservatives then to assume that uh, anything that isn't exactly like American conservatism still isn't conservative, right? Uh, and that's just not the case. Uh, and one of the ways in which it's not the case is that from the very beginning, American conservatives had to wrestle with a very powerful, very pronounced liberal movement uh, in their own country, uh, which meant that American conservatism from the beginning uh, was indelibly stamped with prominent liberal elements. Uh, and you can mm -hmm. see this, for instance, in Madisonian republicanism, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Where he believes in property rights, he believes in rights to expression, doesn't believe in democracy, right? Because the job of the state is to militate against class warfare, right? Uh, and, you know, the demos can't be allowed to have too much power, otherwise they'll start asking for crazy things like the rich to pay their fair share, right? Um, but, you know, there was an illiberal strand to American conservatism, a very prominent illiberal strand in the American South in particular, focused on racism uh, and the belittlement of people of color, right? Uh, but it always had to confront uh, this very powerful liberal movement, even uh, on the part of right-wing liberals, uh, like people like Madison, right? Uh, that was not the case uh, in Europe, uh, where liberalism was far more contested, took root much later, uh, and even to this day, uh, isn't really is entirely firmly placed um, in many countries, for instance, like Poland and Hungary, right? Uh, so this means that European conservatism uh, is much happier to be overtly illiberal uh, or even anti-liberal uh, than its American counterpart is, where most American conservatives historically at least made concessions uh, to Madisonian or Hayekian uh, flavorings, uh, flavors of liberalism, right? Uh, and what you're seeing right now, and I think you put this very well, uh, is that post-liberal or anti-liberal or illiberal American conservatives are weirdly enough having to look to Europe and the European conservative tradition for inspiration uh, for their own kind of projects, uh, which is unusual when you think that historically, uh, after the Second World War especially, the influence, or sorry, the um, chain of influence uh, was moved the opposite direction, right? right. You know, where uh, it was American conservatism that influenced European conservatism to become more liberal. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that even in, in the case of, say, the conflicts in the Tories in England, um, we saw, we have seen, I mean, I would not know that I would say Boris Johnson is more European, but you've seen a move away from the kind of gop of the Tories under mm -hmm. under the prior two leader uh, under the prior two prime ministers to a kind of quasi-populist, very very Italian slash Marine Le Pen filling mm -hmm. sort of rhetoric, even if it has mostly the same policies behind it. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's interesting to me. And, and that brings us to, you know, one of the things that I find interesting about this is in the GOP and under Trumpism, Trump still had to, with the exception of immigration policy under the executive branch in specific. And, um, and tariffs and trade negotiations, he mostly still governed as a classic oh, yeah. Republican, even if his rhetoric was completely different. Um, what do we need to understand that and why that happened? And like maybe people understanding a fight within Trumpism, because I think Bannon is actually the example of someone who really believes the kind of ideas that would come out of Demestra and um, to some degree Burke and Oakenshot, whereas you know, Trump doesn't really have an ideology, but it's... No, very fair. I, I mean, there's a lot to be said about this, and we can talk about it for quite some time if you wanted. But I think Corey Robin put it really well uh, in the latest version of the Reactionary Mind, which is that when you really think about it, American conservatism, rather than being particularly strong at the moment, is actually in a very precarious position, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Democrats have won seven, the popular vote in seven out of eight of the last 10 of elections, right? Uh, there's high levels of support for more progressive policies, particularly around things like healthcare. Uh, and education reform, uh, even moderate levels of migration uh, enjoy reasonably high levels of support typically, right? Uh, and so it's very difficult if you're an American conservative to think that you can win just by mobilizing a base uh, 
uh, a right-wing base that's committed to your specific policies without lumping other people into a coalition, uh, mm -hmm. usually through being opposed to whatever it is that the liberals and progressives are doing. Uh, and then also hoping that to uh, praying to God uh, that the kind of inbuilt biases of the American constitutional order uh, will allow you to sweep to victory with 45% of the vote, right? Um, and so what you saw with Trumpism uh, early on uh, was many post-liberals in particular, people like Bannon, uh, Bannon's not really post-liberal, I should call him a traditionalist instead, right? Somebody mm -hmm. like the Alexander Dugan people. Uh, mm -hmm. But post-liberals, you know, like uh, Patrick Deneen, Yoram Mazzaroni, uh, Sora Bamari, uh, put their faith in Trump to be somewhat of a more transformative figure. Uh, and the most intelligent amongst them all acknowledged that he was very imperfect vessel, you know, imperfect mm. up the yin yang, you know. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact that he was not talking like a conventional American Republican uh, and the fact that, frankly, he just wasn't very smart meant that you might be able to push him uh, in a more post liberal, anti liberal, illiberal direction, right? Um, and, you know, people like Bannon and Deneen in particular hoped uh, that this would include economic reforms that would allow them to build a genuinely long-term conservative coalition centered around post-liberal values, right, social mm -hmm. values, uh, but also soft uh, left-wing economics with a socially conservative twist, mm -hmm. right? Um, and this is an idea that they picked up from countries like Poland uh, with law and justice uh, or Viktor Orban um, with Fidesz, right? Uh, both of which are socially conservative, anti-immigrant parties, very Catholic, uh, but nonetheless are a little bit more welfareist. Um, than a traditional neoliberal, for instance, would be, right? Uh, and of course, as you pointed out, that's not what Trump ended up doing, right? Uh, he did push forward some more draconian, socially conservative policies around things like immigration uh, and around things like anti-wokeism, let's just mm. call it that. Uh, not to mention, you know, doing the typical GOP thing, which is stack the courts, you know, clamp down on efforts of democratic mobilization. But he never really took this ambitious effort uh, to build a new conservative coalition that would be more lasting than the GOP's traditional one, uh, through trying to reach out to people through economic reforms, right? Uh, and so I think what you're starting to see people now like Mark Rubio or Josh Hawley uh, and their intellectual defenders doing uh, is trying to do Trumpism except smarter uh, by actually doubling down on those kind of economic reforms since they realize that there's a hunger uh, for the ki those kinds of things. Um, and I think it can be a winning combination for them if they go for something like left-ish economics uh, with very right-wing, socially conservative values. Yeah, so um, I guess I can frame this in, in people understanding various positions. So let's talk about like the old guard of the GOP. Who would you say would be the three or four thinkers you need to understand to understand what the hell is going through the minds of Mitch McConnell besides just congressional calculus? Because there is actually a ruling ideology there. You mean Mitch McConnell? Yeah. I, I would say that, you know, you'd need to have a good background in American fusionism, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So Bill Buckley uh, or Frank Meyer are both good places to go for that, right? Um, I would recommend Buckley probably more, even though Frank Meyer, I'd say, is a better thinker. Uh, just because Buckley embodies, you know, the fighting spirit uh, of, you know, kind of bullshit American writers uh, better. Um, if you're talking about the kind of neoliberal policies, um, mm -hmm that would be endorsed by someone like uh, Ryan uh, or Mitch McConnell in his heyday. Uh, looking at somebody like F.A. Hayek is really important, right? Uh, mm -hmm. To understand neoliberalism at its intellectual best. Uh, if you want a kind of literary uh, exposition, not of neoliberal ideas, but of kind of hyper-capitalist ideas, obviously Ayn Rand is a very important touchstone. Uh, she mm -hmm. wasn't a very good philosopher at all. Even other libertarians, philosophers like... Uh, Jason Brennan and Rosick are kind of embarrassed by her. Uh, but there's no doubt that that book, Atlas Shrugged, kind of provided a moral basis, uh, in their minds at least, for capitalism uh, that remains unequal. So that's very important. Uh, and when it comes to foreign policy, if you want to understand um, neoconservatism uh, and then mm -hmm. some of the reactions against it, uh, I would say that you know, both of the crystals, Irving Crystal and Bill Crystal, very important uh, to look at their work. Uh, very articulate, often quite frightening, uh, but they have a very good way of articulating uh, not just, you know, the kind of ambitious empire building project uh, that they feel America should engage in, uh, but they also associate that with, again, this theory of decline and fall uh, and the anxieties around that and a way that you don't see some other uh, neoconservatives, people like Michael Ignatiev, uh, doing as effectively. Yeah, so I want people to understand this um, idea. 
ideological spectrum thing for the way that they would approach this. Because I also think one of the things we both tell people is if you're going to fight the right, you actually have to read them. And oh, yeah. You, you not only have to read them, and I know this makes people uncomfortable, you need to be able to put yourself temporarily in their mindset to understand how dangerous it is. I do not say that to like try to like, oh, you're going to become that. No, no, you know, obviously. But if you don't understand mm -hmm. what's motivating them and how their appeals work, you don't understand a whole lot of like what they were willing to do as a coalition. For example, um, the moral majority, cool. neoconservatives and paleoconservatives were all part, you know, of, of the Reagan administration. And as you hinted mm -hmm. in the beginning, that was maintainable because of the communist threat. Oh yeah. And, and really the lack of the communist threat is what caused neo and paleo conservative to actually define themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, um, but, but that's been a crisis on the right now for, I get both of our lifetimes, but it's been very oh, yeah. quiet unless you're in right wing circles. Um, Oh, absolutely. Right. Uh, and I mean, it's worth noting that in the 1990s, when the project for the new American century uh, was getting going, um, you know, a lot of people thought it was the end of history period. You know, this is Francis mm -hmm. Sukuyama's point uh, that there was really nothing to be worried about any longer. America had won. Uh, Western civilization had triumphed and everything was going to be smooth sailing from now on. You know, McDonald's would spread across the globe. Uh, you know, eventually we would have Arnold Schwarzenegger appearing in Chinese cinemas and it would be OK. You know, uh, and what's interesting about it is that even people like Fukuyama, if you actually read his book, didn't necessarily think that was a good thing, right? Because they'd say, look, if we fall victim to this conceit uh, that we have nothing left worth struggling for, uh, then either that's going to lead to us getting caught off guard by new enemies externally, uh, or again, it's going to lead to cultural decline, uh, decadence, uh, and materialism. Uh, which is really interesting, right? When you think mm -hmm. that for a lot of these people initially, the fight against communism was a fight for capitalism, right? Which you think is fundamentally a materialist philosophy, uh, not materialist in the philosophical sense, but materialist in the sense, you know, get as much as I can from me, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that immediately they were like, we cannot have this tells you a lot about the conservative attitude generally, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that it's not necessarily attached to any economic form of organization, right? Uh, it's attached to a hierarchical way of thinking about things, uh, which capitalism can complement, right? Uh, but if capitalism does not produce the right social hierarchy uh, or could lead to a decline in our kind of vital energies uh, because we become too market oriented, uh, then we don't necessarily have to do away with it, but we can certainly sideline it uh, for other concerns, right? And this is something I think even some American conservatives who just think about conservatism in terms of pro-capitalism don't really understand um, if you look at the kind of broader tradition. Um, so I guess this brings up these names that you and I, I think, are familiar with, but I think my audience and probably your audience, too, knows the least about. And that is these post-liberals. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them have relationships to people who are known in post-left crowds, like... Uh, Patrick Deneen has done work with Michael Lind and Michael Lind has done work with mm -hmm. the bellows, you know, but, but they, they really need to be understood in their own terms. Sure. Um, their books are persuasive and I have seen, and they have had a lot more effect on that, on the second tier of conservative intellectual punditry mm -hmm. in the last five years. And I think people realize because every time I read, oh, yeah like Ross Dunhan, or even lately David Brooks, I'm like, you sound like Deneen all of a sudden. That's new. Everybody um, sounds like Deneen all of a sudden. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So just for those of your listeners who aren't um, familiar, uh, so Patrick Deneen um, is a very intelligent political theorist, I should say, right? Um, writes very clearly in a very deep and provocative way. Um, knows his stuff. Uh, so you know, no disrespect there. Uh, my differences with him are ideological, but he's a professor at the University of Notre Dame, uh, comes from a kind of uh, right-wing Catholic um, position. And I say that because, you know, there are left-wing species of Catholicism out there. Um, but, you know, he is primarily famous now uh, for his book, Why Liberalism Failed, uh, which mm -hmm. I think was released in 2018. Yeah, yeah tw around then, 2018, um, which made this argument that liberalism, as the title uh, suggested, has failed. Uh, and that we need to move towards a post-liberal future. 
Uh, and what's interesting about uh, this book is he launches a kind of imminent critique of liberalism uh, that would be familiar to anybody who spent a little bit of time with Karl Marx, because uh, he says liberalism didn't fail because something external attacked it. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, it failed because there were imminent, doesn't use this term, but contradictions within it, uh, that the liberal poli polity, liberal state, was never able to fundamentally resolve. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the biggest of these contradictions uh, is between this demand for absolute freedom um, on the part of liberal subjects and the need to have a state that empowers you to do that, right? Uh, which is why he says, you know, despite all the conservative wrangling about how the state's grown, um, the fundamental reality is that if you want to be a libertarian, you're going to need a big state to empower everybody to be as free as possible, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, it's more subtle than that, but the end of his book runs that we need to move into a post-liberal future that becomes more focused on localism, uh, a kind of traditionalism, uh, and ultimately return to a religious ethic, uh, preferably one, uh, I think in his opinion, that's oriented around a kind of neo-Aristotelian, neo-Thomistic uh, uh, worldview, right? Okay. Uh, and anthropology. Um, and I mean, this he echoes a lot of other uh, earlier post-liberal thinkers, people like Peter Lawler, for example. Yeah, he, he reminds me of Peter Lawler plus, plus <laughs> you know, uh, Alester McIntyre when he gave up on Marxism. <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, very, very much uh, on the same ground. Um, you know, I mean, McIntyre would never see his project as as hostile to the left. Oh no! As as if anything, uh, McIntyre seems to have uh, also re offered us a few new olive branches. Where he starts, uh, he started talking again about economic redistribution and end of capitalism. So, yeah. yeah. But but it does. It, it is interesting that Deneen kind of has seemed to find a way to take those two strains add them together and come up with a new conservative thought. Mm -hmm. And it's been highly influential, I think. I mean, for much as people talk about like J.D. Vance, uh, Vance or whatever, and that strain of the also new kind of populist, mm -hmm. it seems like Deneen really is kind of the high thinker of this period. And it, it, I, I've been I've been somewhat concerned that, you know, leftist thinkers go for the sexy but weird, like Nick Land or Curtis Chauvin yeah. or... Are um, and not someone like Deneen, um, who who even like I said, the reason why I did that genealogy tracing him to like Michael Lennon to the Bellows is because he's he's even having influence in the post Bernie left. Like, oh, absolutely. I mean, Cornell yeah. West uh, talked about why he how he liked his book, um, which is no disrespect to Cornell West because I can see why. Right. Um, the thing is, you're you're absolutely right that uh, Nick Land. Uh, kind of what is it hyper racism uh, yeah. is now the term right um mm -hmm. definitely is provocative uh he's kind of a high level intelligent troll right mm -hmm. uh, but i think in terms of staying power someone like Deneen uh is ultimately going to be around for a lot longer and he's not just going to be around because he's a smart guy uh you know, problematically smart uh, if you want to criticize his ideas right uh mm -hmm. but because there are actual countries in the world right now that seem to embody the kind of thing that he's talking about again you can look at poland and hungary uh as exemplars uh, some people are increasingly talking about Brazil, uh, which is a major nation, right, uh, along the same lines. You know, and there's people who talk about China as an example of this, even. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, without the Catholicism there, obviously, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, and so it's very possible that this kind of stuff, uh, since it has a model now that it can point to, uh, can actually make a case for why it's practically achievable to build something uh, like a conservative post-liberalism in the United States. And, you know, this is mm -hmm. something that uh, outlets like First Things, for example, which is a right-wing Catholic uh, magazine um, in the United States, uh, have been agitating for. They say, why can't we have economic policies like Poland, uh, where, yeah. you know, the state will provide you with money to have more children. Uh, and then, you know, you'll raise them Roman Catholic and we'll combine that with strong anti-immigration policies and eventually we'll have a society of good white Roman Catholics. You know, right. I mean, yeah, really it, it, right. Exactly. Particularly right Roman Catholics. None of those Southern ones. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I mean, it's interesting because it, it also reflects, the, I think if people understand Latin American conservatism, mm -hmm. we're beginning to look a lot, ironically, right. But we're beginning to look yeah. a lot more like that because that Catholic right, um, going all the way back to Demestra is clearly there. One of the things I think that that, that has been underestimated, even though the, I mean technically Catholicism is the largest religion in the United States of any singular <laughs> denomination, but like the the United States has Protestant her heritage and the GOP specific dependence mm 
mm-hmm. on evangelicalism has complicated, uh, I think, its ability to use this effectively. But that may be ending because evangelicalism is just dying so fast it can't even see straight. So, no, absolutely right. Uh, and I think part of the problem also is that um, Protestantism was always a lot more amenable to certain strands of Protestantism. I shouldn't say I mm. don't want to write with, uh, you know, paint with too big a uh, bright a brush. But, you know, certain strands of Protestantism, particularly American Protestantism, were always very amenable uh, both to liberalism, um, but there are even, you know, some uh, Protestant movements now that are very open to socialism. Uh, mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so I wrote for a magazine, um, The Bias, all right, mm-hmm. uh, for the Institute for Christian Socialism. Uh, and one of the kind of mantras, uh, I use the term ironically, that, you know, we keep talking about is, you know, mm-hmm. if you look at Protestant individualism and this notion that uh, everyone is sacred and everyone has uh, a kind of obligation to develop themselves uh, according to their own inner light, uh, which was given to them by God, uh, the best society to achieve that would be something like a socialist society. Right. Um, and there's never been that kind of individualist outlook uh, in many parts of Roman Catholicism, uh, which has always been more communitarian, more traditionalist, uh, considerably more focused on the importance of social hierarchies. You know, mm. think about the church, right? Uh, so it, it maps on to the yearning uh, of a lot of conservatives for those kinds of things, um, which is why I think a lot of these post liberal Catholics uh, are now the sexiest, uh, as it were, thinkers on the political right. Uh, rather than somebody who operates from a more Protestant kind of perspective, or one of the yeah. reasons, I should say. Uh, yeah, I would also say it's, it's the post liberal Catholics and then like the traditionalist Orthodox, like Ron Dreyer. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, uh, I just wanted to make sure that we explain that for our audience because I think the post liberal thinkers, that's the newest. And if you're not following the right, like I read, I actually read First Things and have for like 20 years. But <laughs> yeah. like, no, I'm, I'm pretty not- regular. Anytime Sora Bamari retweets something, I, I read it to get angry about it. <laughs> yeah. I, well, it's interesting also because occasionally first things will like publish somebody like David Bentley Hart's appeal for like Christian socialism just to be like, see, we will make more yeah, ways see, to we- left traditionalists. Like, no, you don't, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, there are some. I mean, the British Catholic tradition is a little bit more open to up. Um, you think about something like John Milbank, uh, theology and social theory. He says, you know, let's have a Catholic socialism. So it's not mm-hmm. impossible, right? Uh, Lopek had mm-hmm. a very interesting dialogue with Slava Zizek, by the way, mm-hmm. people should check out, called uh, The Monstrosity of Christ, uh, if you're mm-hmm. interested in that kind of thing. Uh, but, you know, it's hard. It's a harder sell to Roman Catholics <laughs> to get them to buy into socialism than I think it is for Protestants. Mm-hmm. Purely, you know, my opinion. But um, Yeah, it's, it's, it's probably because, I don't know, I, I'm going to make a Catholic argument, actually, so mm-hmm. people come up. But I think it's probably because Protestants are already one step closer to secularization anyway. Uh, you could say that. I mean, I'm, I think a lot of the Catholics would agree with you. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it, it, I think this has been sort of a thing that I think has been happening slowly. And if you even look, it's been coming in the comments. If you look at like the intellectual thinkers around the right for about 20 years have been mm-hmm. moving slowly from, you know, frankly, Niebuhr to increasingly Catholics, you know, I there's very, I don't, is there a Protestant? There might be one Protestant on the Supreme Court now. Like, I don't know. Is Gor- No, Gorshak was, Gorshak was John Finnis's student. So at least he comes out of that tradition. Mm-hmm. Is he Protestant though? I don't know. Yeah. Don't quote me on uh, that. Most of them, most of them are Catholics and have been for a while. Mm-hmm. So it's, 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 you see this in the leadership of, uh, of this society. I also think that's led to this weird tension between like the, the intellectuals and (laughs) the more neoliberal wing of the GOP, which still has a strong place in Congress, just out of, just out of an incumbent inertia, you know, like, um, and, but to go back there, the, the one, the one thing that's different about Trump than say, someone like Deneen whose whose support would have been very tenuous and like holding your nose the whole time. Oh yeah. Is something related back to De- Demestre. And that's, and that's these people who just believe not only do you need a religious foundation to society, you need an utterly irrational one. And, mm-hmm. and like, that's why, that's why they, they can be totally for promoting insane conspiracy theories, which they which most of them mm-hmm. don't believe with, with a few exceptions, right? Well, this is kind of the point that I made in my book on postmodern conservatism, right? Which mm-hmm. is that 
uh, postmodernism is a cultural condition created by late capitalism or neoliberal capitalism, however you want to frame it, amongst other things. You know, liberalism and secularism played their role. Uh, but what it's defined by is a decreasing trust in traditional epistemic authorities, which you would think uh, would be contrary uh, to what conservatives would want, right? Uh, but one of the points that I argue in my book is that actually that needn't necessarily be the case because one of the epistemic authorities that people increasingly come to question are the epistemic authorities associated with enlightenment rationalism, right? Um, and all of its kind of subsets uh, going down through Marxism and socialism, right, which are also creatures of the Enlightenment. So what people have been able to do, particularly on the conservative right, uh, under the conditions of postmodernity, is to draw upon the cultural reservoirs of skepticism towards epistemic authority to say, look, you know, you have your facts and we have our alternative facts, mm -hmm. right? You believe in the scientists about climate change. We don't, right? Uh, and the motivations uh, behind this um, are also a lot more amenable to many conservatives than it would be to progressives, uh, because of course, when you say we can be skeptical of epistemic authorities, uh, then what that can give you a lot of license to do is to say that I'm going to buy into those epistemic uh, and moral authorities that coincide with my traditionalist vision uh, of how things can be. Uh, and no one is under any condition, no one is any position to criticize those, uh, yeah. whether they be Christian conservative, nationalist, whatever, right? Uh, and this is also why I think that a lot of people have pointed out that Trumpism has always been more an affair of the gut uh, than the head, right? Uh, precisely because it appeals so much to identity, affect, uh, a sense of agonistic decline uh, as a country kind of falls apart because of progressive elites. Um, and, you know, this yearning uh, to back an authority that speaks to you, whether they're right or not, right? Mm. That, no, I think I think that's a pretty good analysis of it. And I think, um, I mean, one of the things I will say is that the declinist narrative at this period of American, you know, in relationship to his empire, et cetera. Um, I think what one of the ways that it, it can sneak in into less peers, and I say this as a person who in the early in the early aughts and late nineties was very much aligned with the anti-globalization movement, mm -hmm. got very frustrated with it. Um, got got caught up with antiwar.com was, mm -hmm. you know, I was a Buddhist, not not a Catholic, but I had come from <laughs> a, but I come from a Jubu and Catholic background, actually. So mm -hmm. the Catholic thinkers were in my sphere. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got pulled into that world for, for a few years, not for a whole long time, for about four years. Mm -hmm. But it's it I, I I see it happening multiple times because unlike the neoliberal um orientation this sounds a lot like what marxists mean the, the, the contradictions of liberalism being a big part mm -hmm. of it but th i think some of the differences are one um it has a corporatist view of the way the nation works and class mm -hmm. works so we should take care of the classes but they stay in those classes oh yeah like like you know yeah if anything there's a very patriarchal sensibility to it, right? Which is not coincidental, I should say, where the idea is that we want to have a state that tends to its citizens uh, as long as, A, the citizens know their place, right? And they understand what their role is within, usually organicist metaphors are popular, so the organic whole, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And then there's also the problem, which is uh, we get to decide who's going to be a citizen and who's not going to be. Uh, and that can mean excluding a lot of people who we don't think are worthy uh, of that entitlement. Uh, and again, this isn't just a theoretical issue. This is precisely what's happened in countries like Poland or Hungary, right? Um, mm -hmm. Which became extremely xenophobic very quickly, uh, where the kind of politics became very sharply defined by an us-them kind of mentality. Uh, and where the government is increasingly stripping rights away uh, from large segments of the population, even the Polish and Hungarian population, uh, that they don't think are so-called real Poles or real Hungarians, right? Right. So, you know, I think that... It can look vaguely progressive on the surface, uh, but it's not, right? Uh, it's, in fact, in many cases, considerably more dangerous uh, than earlier versions of reaction, uh, precisely because it has this kind of gloss to it with some anti-capitalist brightening up. Uh, but people should not buy it, right? They should buy the real thing, uh, which is why they shouldn't endorse, you know, some flavor of democratic socialism, um, and there are plenty available right now. Yeah, I, I would say um, 
I, I would uh, I would say I've been interested in in this because I think this problem, this post liberal turn, mm -hmm. it, I think you can even look to non European nations for it. I mean, like mm -hmm. like you see it in Colombia, um, India. India. Oh yeah, the Modi. Now now with the case of Modi, there is a stronger well. I was about to say that, except when we talk about Le Pen and and then the, and then the mm -hmm. and then the Liga, which have direct fascist parallels. But there's a uh, strong, there, but with the case of, of Modi, there's a stronger historical lace to to out and out pure fascism because of the, um, because of the way they adopt um, the way the Hindu Vadas deliberately appropriated a lot of Nazi stuff during during the existence of the Reich. Sadly, so, like, little known fact, isn't it? Um, yeah. If people want, there's a really good book uh, by Ben Tettelbaum. We interviewed him mm -hmm. for a channel I'm part of, actually called Plastic Pills, which, mm -hmm. you know, shameless plug. Uh, if you're interested in this, you know, check out Plastic Pills in our podcast. Uh, but Ben Tettelbaum uh, wrote a book called The War for Eternity, um, which is about Bannon and the traditionalist movement, where he talks actually about uh, how a lot of these Nazis wound up inspiring uh, various uh, movements in the subcontinent. Really strange, right? Uh, but kind of fascinating again in that perverse way, uh, if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah, so, I would, yeah. I would, I would say India is where it actually has significant geopolitical effect. Mm -hmm. um, and but I, I, I think what I see is this happening more and more around the world. I mean, like, so, um, and that that's a little concerning. And the other thing I'll say, just as a, a note of ominousness, while this kind of conservatism actually seems to be on a defensive. In the United States, still, mm -hmm. um, you know, Trump's base is rabid, but it's also losing interest very fast. QAnon is an unsustainable conspiracy model, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, and so forth. The um, there is a real sense that, like, I think in France, um, in particular, and I was afraid mm -hmm. of this with the Liga coalition government in Italy too, but it didn't actually happen. But in France in particular, we're very close to a very strong movement that has even more virulent versions of a lot of these ideas in it. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, um, Marine Le Pen, for those of you who guess, uh, sorry, for those of you listeners who don't know, um, is the daughter of Jean-Marie Le Pen, uh, who is the founder of the National Front Front National in France, uh, which wasn't quite a fascism uh, fascist movement, but it's called Fascism Light. Uh, yeah, it's fascist light. It's kind of like the Sweden Democrats. Right, exactly. Right. You know, very, very, very uh, open to accepting, you know, Vichy collaborators, people with questionable views about so-called race science, Holocaust deniers, you name it. Uh, and Marine Le Pen tried to rebrand the party by dropping uh, the National Front label, by distancing herself from her father, uh, and by bringing in, you know, kind of a younger cadre uh, of individuals to kind of run for office. She's also done the kind of Polish-Hungarian thing, which is to adopt a kind of quasi leftist rhetoric on the economy where she's critical of globalization, neoliberalization, uh, you know, argues for jobs for the French, higher wages for the French and always the French, uh, which is, you know, who she gets, she gets the one who gets to determine that. Right. Um, yeah. but you know, very recently, um, a bunch of retired military generals in France, there's a good piece in Jacobin about this for those who are interested, uh, released a letter to Macron saying, uh, we want you to stop with these anti-racism campaigns. Uh, and you need to cut off migration as well. And if you don't, there's going to be trouble, uh, by which they mean, you know, there's going to be a coup or a civil war. Uh, and Marie Le Pen actually endorsed uh, this view. Uh, mm -hmm. And she was very popular for doing that, right? Uh, so like you said, I think that's a very worrying sign since when you have large segments of the military and a powerful uh, quasi-fascist far-right uh, mass movement uh, and they're willing to work together, that's a very bad combination. Right. Uh, thank God that's not what we saw in the United States, because, mm -hmm. I mean, can you imagine what would have happened if Trump had the support of the U.S. military? We'd be looking at a very different world right now. Yeah, I mean, he wouldn't have to use backstops from uh, from from the Department of Homeland Security. To, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. To do stuff. Um, I mean, it, it, it is interesting. I don't want to give credence to the deep state ideas that like, you know, conspiracy theories has. But it is interesting how the American bureaucracy is a essentially a centrist a centrist liberal bureaucracy <laughs> like even in its war machine <laughs> like and that's kind of how it works and it is both infuriating but also important to understand that when looking at what trump was and was not able to do even with his executive power um so
Oh, absolutely, right? I mean, uh, Corey Robin wrote, again, uh, about this very eloquently in the New York Review of Books uh, during the whole election year, frankly, where I, I think he was just having an aneurysm day in and day out. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, one of the things that he points out, again, is that um, we were, in some senses, very fortunate uh, that Trump came to power at a time when the conservative movement in the United States, contra appearances and contra all the mantra posturing, uh, was actually quite weak, right? Mm. Uh, I mean, if you compare Trump's levels of support to Reagan's, for example, during the 1980s, uh, and the kind of overlapping consensus uh, about Reaganism, um, it's quite notable that, you know, he never won the popular vote. Uh, he lost the midterms. Uh, large segments of society and the state were always opposed to what he was trying to do. And there are people in his own party uh, who weren't exactly happy with what happened, right? Um, and Kobe came along and he lost the election, right? Uh, we can't necessarily count on that happening again, right? Uh, but it is also an opportunity because the fact that American conservatism is so shrill is a testament to its weakness. Uh, and that means we have a moment right now where we could genuinely push some sincerely progressive policies um, through the window um, and not necessarily expect a huge counter, uh, a counter lash uh, to those. Uh, and I think that you're seeing Biden do something in his own mediocre way to this effect uh, with, you know, the new spending programs, uh, aimed at the most vulnerable members of the population. It's not nearly enough. Uh, it needs to be a lot more militant, uh, but it is nice to see that for a change. And I don't think you would have seen even these kind of marginal reforms unless American conservatism was in a very weak state at the moment. Uh, and my response to that is we should kick it while it's down, uh, and then keep on kicking uh, until, you know, there's as little left of it as possible. All right, and I think that's a good note to end on. I want to also endorse plastic pills. My um, my co-author and uh, close friend Shalon Van Tyne has been over there to talk about. Um, the... Shalon's a brilliant theorist, by the way. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, we'll yeah, she was talking about Adorno, um, a mutual shared problematic fave of ours. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, does anybody and, like have an uninhibited love of Adorno, right? Everybody's kind of like, yeah, Adorno's great, but you know, I do like jazz music. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like the Beatles, you know. I and watch TV that's not, you know, some kind of post surreal whatever, you know. Everything isn't structurally fascist, bro. Yeah, um, exactly, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but yeah. Um, so I want to give you an endorsement for that. I also think you should check out your book on. Um, all your books on postmodern conservatism. I also liked your work on Jordan Peterson. I'm sorry, because I worked with zero books, I unfortunately had to learn way more about Jordan Peterson than I cared to. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but um, but I, I, I did think that because I remember there was like the big debate about Peterson at the Jordan Peterson conferences, fash or not fash, and mm -hmm. like me and Burgess and some other actually some some, some even some postmodernist thinkers. We're just like neither, like, <laughs> yeah. like neither nor, right? Neither nor. Like mm -hmm. there are things that are adjacent, but mostly he's a weird liberal, a particularly weird one. But, but, but yeah. Oh, absolutely. And by, yeah. and by liberal, I mean conservative liberal. You know, a hundred percent, right? And I mean, there are legit fascists out there. I mean, mm -hmm. fucking hell, they send me crappy emails all the time, right? You know, it always opens with you know. Muslims this, Jews this, you know, blah, 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 you're going to die. You know, usually some, you know, homophobic slur at the end, you know, faggot or whatever. Uh, but, you know, th the reality is that we can't paint everyone with this brush. Uh, and I think this testifies to what you were saying at the beginning, which is that a lot of progressives don't spend enough time looking at the political right and what's wrong with it. So they assume that when there's a kind of commonality uh, between something they heard uh, and something else that they're familiar with, that they must be the same thing, Right. Uh, and that's just not always the case, right? Jordan Peterson definitely says things that are fascist adjacent at points uh, or speak to that kind of far right urge uh, for order, discipline, uh, meaning, uh, transcendent meaning, as it were. But that doesn't make him a fascist, right? Uh, it makes it something else uh, that's also very bad. Uh, but it's important to understand that it's in its own terms rather than just kind of reducing it uh, down to something we're familiar with because it's easier to kind of deal with it and dismiss it that way. Yeah, um, we got. We're, I'm gonna. I'm gonna give my audience one, our mutual friend, one question this time. I usually, give him more. But um, is Nietzsche useful to the left? And I think you and I have a divergent opinions on this. So go. <laughs> okay, good. Um, well, I, I should say, 
I love Nietzsche, right? I was really inspired by him when I was younger. He was one of the first philosophers I ever read. Uh, you know, I read the Antichrist and I was electrified by it, right? Just completely changed my worldview. Uh, but I think that one of the difficulties that come from interpreting Nietzsche is it's very tempting uh, on the political left to read progressive views into him that simply weren't there, right? Uh, which isn't to say he doesn't offer theoretical tools to progressives uh, that are extremely useful. The genealogical method, the criticism of religious traditionalism, you know, more anti-moralism, you name it. Uh, but his own views were pretty fundamentally reactionary. And he makes this abundantly clear throughout his entire oeuvre, right, where he talks about the need to have a restoration of the aristocratic principle in human societies, uh, that there are some people who simply are better than others, and they are entitled to prey upon the weak, uh, mm -hmm. who are going to be mana uh, for their kind of grandiose projects. Um, and, you know, in his denunciations of liberalism and socialism as essentially just vulgar Christianity uh, for a secular age, both of which need to be dismissed uh, and will be overcome uh, when the Ubermensch arise, inevitably. Uh, so if we're going to take Nietzsche seriously and we're going to use him on the political left, uh, we need to do so with the full knowledge that we're taking somebody who held very different views to us uh, and we're appropriating his tools for tasks which he would not put them to. And as long as we're okay with that, it's fine. Uh, but we should be cognizant of what it is that we're doing. I would actually pretty much agree with that. I always tell people, you know, even though Walter Kaufman's light, Nietzsche was not a particularly anti-Semitic thinker. Mm -hmm. um, he also was not particularly racialist. He still, um, and Kaufman and the existential progressives try to hide this. Oh, yeah. Utterly reactionary. He's probably, frankly, the smartest reactionary thinker that Europe produced. Oh, undoubtedly. But, undoubtedly. Like, but he's a reactionary. Um, he is useful for the left because of his ability to see through a lot of liberal bullshit. But like that's <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's um, you know like but even that like there is a way in which that itself is dangerous because because you know seeing through liberal BS and and moving beyond liberalism is not just blanket negating it. Um, and you know I am somewhat sympathetic to the idea that. Marxism is not, it, I think you and I disagree on how liberal it is actually, but Marxism is yeah. not anti, not cleanly anti-liberal. It's more an attempt to become post-liberal. Like we're moving beyond this. I would say sincerely um, post-liberal as opposed to the kind of pseudo post-liberal uh, that a lot of post-liberalism post that a lot of post-liberals hold to. Right? right. Well, yeah. When we talk about the post-liberal, you know, what, what they're actually doing is, they're, they're they're soft traditionalists is what they are. Um, Sometimes not even very soft, <laughs> right? Um, so but, you know, it's it's that, and people need to know it. Um, if I was going to tell people to read a book on Nietzsche, I think Walter Kaufman's is fine, but re also read if you can get it. I don't, is it available readily in English? I actually don't remember. Uh, Dominic uh, Dominic Lacerto's um, right right up on Nietzsche as like you know the most brilliant reactionary critique of uh, of liberalism, and I think it actually is good. It's part of his liberalism counter history book, but he has another book on it that I've read, but I can't remember if my translation was legal. So like, um, I haven't read that one. Uh, I'll make a different recommendation if people are interested in this one, uh, and it'd be um, well, there's two: uh, Malcolm Bull's Anti Nietzsche, uh, mm. which is a really good book uh, published with Verso Press. Um, Comprehensive, very interesting, does a good job of showing what's valuable in Nietzsche while also pointing out at the end that he is not an egalitarian. Uh, he is the mm -hmm. farthest thing from an egalitarian. Uh, another book that's very interesting uh, is by my friend Ronald Beener, uh, who's a professor at the University of Toronto, called Dangerous Ma Minds, uh, Nietzsche Heidegger and the Far Right, uh, which people might also be interested in since he talks about how it is that Nietzsche and Heidegger's ideas have influenced uh, the contemporary alt-right, far-right movements, traditionalists. Uh, very short, only about 150 pages, really easy to read. If people are intrigued by these kinds of questions and want to see why a lot of us think that Nietzsche is a pretty conservative guy, that'd be the place mm -hmm. to go to. Um, as far as, since a lot of people have been asking about the weirdo, the weirdo will write, mm -hmm. um, I will give a couple of broad books for them. Right wing, right wing Critics of American Conservatism goes through all the dissident right movements from uh, from isolationism, up through neo reaction, um, and you know I think that's a pretty good guide. Um, and uh, what else would I say? 
Um, against the modern world uh, by Sedgwick, mm -hmm. a history of uh, traditionalism, which goes into like the national Bolshevik movement, mm -hmm. Dugan's history, the, uh, the the Greco and the attempt at the European new, new right. Um, and but but I will also say I think these people are less important than the kind of people around Denin, even though they do have mm -hmm. marginal influence on like like there are as part of Front National who is influenced by Greca and these, you know, these uh, European you right thinkers. But I, I'm guessing a lot more of them are more just straight up norm uh, Catholic traditionalists that are operating off of assumptions similar to Denin, but in a Catholic anti Muslim context. So like yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, one of the things that you'll see about um, European uh, Catholic traditionalism is it's considerably more gloves off uh, mm -hmm. than American post-liberalism, right? Um, because as I mentioned, American post-liberalism still has to make a few concessions uh, to liberal conservatism uh, in the USA because it's such an important uh, part of the conservative coalition, right? Uh, anti-liberals uh, in a European context don't really feel the same compulsion to have to make those kinds of concessions, right? Uh, I mean, like I said, Victor Orban in 2014 and a speech to the Bail Tuznad, uh, which is a kind of conservative Christian uh, organization across European states said, we are building an illiberal democracy, straight up illiberal democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, not even really very democratic anymore, just illiberal state. Um, and you know, you'd be hard pressed to find um, any post-liberal world thinker, uh, even someone like the Deneen, Amari, uh, or Hazonis of the world coming out and being willing to say that. Mm -hmm. I would, I would, I would agree with that. And with that, I think we're gonna let Matt go. Thank you, Matt. Um, what do you want to plug and that you haven't already? Uh, what do I want to plug? Uh, fucking, uh, yeah, check us out on Plastic Pills, uh, and uh, if you want. Check out Ben Burgess's new book, uh, Cancel the Comedians While the World Burns. Uh, I was on chatting about that the other day. Uh, it's a great book. It's really funny. If people haven't read Ben, uh, they 100% should. All right. Thank you very much. And we're headed.